Yeah, a live band, by the way. That thumbs up. Yeah, David. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's all we're getting is there any quick one that's better to put the next next to the Like so they get in. That's right. Oh David. Hi. Oh, sorry, no one can see you. <laughs> David, highlight of your day. How's it going? Not bad. Can you get us? Oh. You've got plenty of food and drink there, have you? Yeah. So, can you hear us all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's good. Okay, so we have like a few seconds of lag, so. Let's start working with that. Right. So, Francis, can you hear us? Yeah, we you, you will. How about you? Yeah. yeah, perfect. And we don't have lag with you somewhat, but OK. Um, uh, what? There's a lag. Give me a second. Um, David, could you say something? Just. Random sentence. Anything at all? One, two, three, four, five. Yep. <laughs> I guess then we can just start, right? Everyone good to go? Or should we wait 10 more minutes? I see. That's fine. I think uh, everything's going to work. Ready to go? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> okay, so this is actually the first time um, London's project is happening. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have David Irwine uh, presenting on introduction to project space. And David is the big B original author of Mating. He will sit and have worked on the film of the largest network uh, project. David is also a published author on papers in the field of complex networking, distributed computing, and cryptography. So thank you, David, for having us here. No, oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. So um, we will have 40, half an hour, minute um, question-led introduction into Project Save, and then we'll have q and a so everyone have questions ready. All right, so I guess we us start now. Right, David. So, can we start um, by using what Mate is? What are the founding principles and how long have you been going so far? Yeah, I can certainly go over that. The, the, the idea behind Mate Safe really was I was working in networking, designing networks uh, about the world, and it became clear to me that data was. Many years ago, it became clear that data was extremely valuable. And I'm not saying it's more valuable than water or food. If the, if the world had uh, no water, water would be valuable. But data was becoming an increasingly valuable commodity. And before the big data thing happened and all the rest, it was, it was patently obvious that data and the protection of data was, was vital to us. And then when you look back in history and you see that, that Alexandria Library and everything disappearing. These things are bad, they're not, not good. And it was also obvious that data is knowledge, and people can't own knowledge, but people own data. And data centers and large companies, and, and also people are prevented from access to data. So that was the big driving force for me. And then was working, I also noticed something else that was very bizarre, was 
all these people had computers and companies and servers and, and whatnot. And they were all backing stuff up onto tapes and discs and whatever else. And I thought that's a bit daft because we're all connected to this one great big network. Why why does every computer not back every other computer up? Why can't they share resources, share processing? Because if if data's so valuable, we shouldn't lose it. So your house burning down should not be you losing your data, and you shouldn't have to ask someone for it. So really, the driving force was that. It was information is extremely valuable in a society that's moving forward, as we are. We're we're killing less people and all the rest of it, but. We weren't moving forward with data. We weren't moving forward with protecting and looking after that data. And that really means making it accessible to every single person on the planet. And the internet was great, but then when you see what's happening and you know, you've know got all these people that can't connect to it or they don't have the computing power. So many years ago, Negroponte came out with this one laptop per child, and I thought, well, that would be great. Why can't we give all these people these cheap laptops and allow them access to a worldwide system where they could store their data, get their data back, communicate with people? Because one laptop per child had a very small CMOS hard drive in it. It was a, I can't remember, it was a few meg, it wasn't anything much. And it was really a step in the right direction, but not good enough. So a real a real sort of motivator was if we could get everybody in the planet to contribute to information and access information, rather than just us a couple of billion people who think we know stuff, involve all the rest of the people in the world. And then you might get someone jumping up from a bush in Kenya and curing cancer and someone else jumping up from somewhere else and fixing the financial system. Unless we us two billion think we're smarter than the other whatever six billion or something then you know we should include everyone so really the, the whole point was if we're moving forward as a society we need to be able to move forward collectively and I think over the past few years it's been really interesting watching the internet develop because we've got all these financial systems we've got politicians going crazy we've got spies spying on us one thing that's great when you share data and share access to information is it's very hard to tell lies. It's very hard to hide behind a truth. So it it just becomes more and more poignant as we as we go along. But it's been a really, really difficult journey uh, because almost everything that, that we've done, that made safe done, the self-authentication, the networking side of things or how you encrypt data in such a way that it can deduplicate uh, properly and securely. Almost everything we've been told that's impossible, that's impossible, that's impossible. And it's another to show people how to do something that, that really people fight against. Everybody fights against change but if you want to make a difference it's how can you do it without going begging to someone just for some monetary thing saying invest in my company and you'll get 10x back and all this. We want to have a situation where people could start companies or start projects with the view to adding value to the planet and to be very focused on that value, very focused on and you'll see MadeSafe going through the whole crypto community and, and people are saying well our project will do this and then we'll do this and then we'll give this out and we'll do this and I think from day one, from the very second that we started, it was privacy, security and freedom for all the world's people, for all of the data in the world and that's a it's a rock solid viewpoint and that's regardless of how profitable it is or or whatever in immediate money. The the, the key issue is get everybody in a, Selfishly, I would love to live forever, so I'd like someone to come up with some way to make people live forever, you know, that then we're never going to achieve anything unless we include everyone. And we're also restricting ourselves when I think we... There's an awful lot of talk about how much is this worth and how much is that worth and can I make money out of this and can I make money out of that. Money's a very secondary issue. It's a really secondary issue. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be part of a, an innovation at all. It's something that you can use to 
convert from one thing to another thing. But there's other ways to it. But we shouldn't be so focused on that. We should be, I think, more focused like what we are in Made Safe on what is it you're here to do? Are you here to engage with everyone and give them more information and access to information? Well, if that's what you're doing, do it. Ignore all the, the value side of things. And like with us, I think we've proven something really interesting with the whole safe coin thing. It's when you attach value to something and then give some mechanism for people to freely uh, and unencumbered transmit that value or transfer that value, all of a sudden things start to become valuable in a, money, a monetary term. So there's some really nice aspects of what we do and how we're doing it. But they're, they're purely a, a result of searching for this. How do we get into the hands of every single person on the planet all of the information that they need to solve the problem in front of them? And give them the ability to give us more information back. And that's, uh, that's really why Made Safe was started. It was, it was all, all about privacy, security, and freedom. And the idea that your data is like your thought in your brain, it's yours. When you speak it, then you're sharing it. That's fantastic. But you don't want to, you don't want to speak every single thought. You, you need to be able to have privacy inside your own head. And when you look at it now, um, the likes of Google or Amazon or these people, they're holding some of your memories and some of your thoughts and calculations. There's no need for that. Those things can be held on the network, on the internet, without ownership moving from the person who has those thoughts or has that data. And that, that's a, a very important thing as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, but it does. Yeah, I think we all agree on that. Um, but privacy, security, and freedom is really important to humanity overall. Um, David, just um, before we dive in a little deeper, can we interrupt you uh, with questions, or should we or do you prefer that you wait? Because Absolutely. Yeah, interrupt me with questions or to say, what the hell are you saying? <laughs> I understand your accent. <laughs> so, Moscow, feel free to um, pitch in as well. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But, uh, yeah, just any, well, any questions well, while we're talking is fine. Hi, David. It's, it's Alex Truscott here. Uh, front row owl is my made safe org name, if you've not seen that. Um, yeah. I was like, with this being such a great idea and possibly a dangerous idea for some of the big organizations like the music industry or film industry, what, how is development or improvements going to continue if some of these organizations decide to attack and try and get you on the back foot to say right, no more releases or try and hold you responsible for someone putting up a, a dump of every single film that's ever existed? or? I know it's I know it's um, free free license or, or public available license, but they are going to want to come after someone. Yeah. And how how will you continue to improve, or how will pods continue to improve the software if they're under attack, as it were? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. We get it quite a lot since we started. We've always said that it used to be, you know, MI5 will come and you have a dot and then disappear. Uh, in fact, the Scottish government was, were looking to put me in a navy, a, a navy base next to here, Gannet, uh, for for loan protection when we started it. But now that now that we're out, or we're not launched yet, but there's there's plenty of software out there. People can see how to build this thing and, and continue to build it without us being present, which I think is good because it gives a distribution of capability, but. It's, it's also something that's, if you're actually, and this, this is why you'll see me in the forum banging on and banging. Two months ago, I caused mayhem in the office by deleting a whole bunch of code that was complex and replacing it with something that was much less complex. And it's, a, it's about 50 times less code, 98% reduction. Because it's not only about being free and the software being available and under a license it has to always be free. <coughs> it's got to be readable. It's got to be something that any programmer that's average or even below average should be able to pick it up and say, I know what this is doing. And it annoys me when you get open source projects like TrueCrypt or even OpenSSL and you look at it and think that's just a bunch of gunk and nobody knows how that stuff works. So there's a 
a lot of things that we have to do and have to consider here. So one, one is that the software has to be free. It's got to be freely available. The development has to be as open as possible. Now we've got, I've spent all day on Slack and we've got private channels in Slack and just answering questions with some of the developers. We're not completely as open as we be because developers are, they're humans, they've got a, not egos to protect, but they're not, they don't want to ask silly questions sometimes. So we try to be as open as possible. But a, a huge thing is try to create code that's extremely readable so that other folk can, can use it. But the other side of the coin as well is there's a, there's a really interesting paradox coming here with people talk about decentralization and decentralizing money or, you know, or networks or whatever. But see if you really look at a lot of decentralized things, they're not decentralized. It, when, it may say what, we're, what we've done, there's not even a, a data structure that's shared between any two computers that's the same. It's completely, it's like a Venn diagram. It's completely decentralized. And that makes, that makes things very difficult. Now, when you, when you build something that becomes completely decentralized, it by default becomes autonomous because there's nothing for you to adjust. You can't really go in and just tweak something or ban someone from the network because you don't know who they are. That paradox or, you know, people could talk about paradigm shift, but it's a paradox, I think, for people who would like to control the, the system or control the network or control its growth. And that paradox is there isn't actually anyone to attack. So the, the, the way to attack it would be find the developers and just put a gun to their eye and tell them to release a piece of code that will wipe the network out. And that becomes an interesting challenge because if you've got something that's completely autonomous, it, it's got a, a level of intelligence. It's not artificial intelligence. There's no such thing as artificial intelligence, actually. But it's got a level of intelligence that allows you to build in protection into the network. At the moment, if you try, if you're a human and interfere with a main safe network, it, it just throws that computer off and ignores you. So you just do yourself damage. But in terms of adding code to the network, it's very close, and I think once we're launched and we've got time to think again, the network will refuse updates that don't improve it. Now, when you get to that stage, it's who, who can stop it? See, originally when I was looking at MadeSafe, and I thought, I'm never going to be able to get people to build this. It's, it's too hard, it's too complex, it's too big, and I don't know if we'll be able to get money to build it, to pay people to help. And I was going to write it as a virus and just let it go everywhere and not be stopped. And I think when the network's up and running, it will look very like a virus because nobody will be able to tell who's running it and who's not. I'm just doing a thing at the moment. I was doing some code. I'm doing all this code just now, which is good and bad, but where it's actually a dual protocol stack, so it's TCP and UDP, and it switches about just to make it not possible even to say it's a particular UDP port or TCP port or even what the protocol is, the protocol will keep changing. And when you have something that's actually decentralized, the attack point becomes very difficult because I've always said folk could shut me down, they could do what they want to me, I don't really care because uh, we're, we're doing this and that's what we're doing. But if we're doing it right, and this is why we have these pods. I think the pods are hugely important. Is that if it's if it, if your if your vision is truly to give everyone this privacy, security, and freedom, and you really want to do it correctly, you want to have this very easy to read code, very easy to understand system that you can distribute that about different pods around about the world. But you also want to have, and we've been very good at this, I think, and and made safe. You also want to insist in zero ego. There's no ego. There's no ownership. People can add to it and take stuff away. Because I need sometimes, oh, somebody's going to beat you to market or somebody's going to do this. And I think, good. If they're going to give everyone privacy, security, and freedom, brilliant. That's fantastic. I'm totally delighted. But 
at the same time, I realise that they vastly underestimate the... We, we didn't take eight years for nothing, you know. We didn't take eight years because we're stupid. There's, there's a lot of intricate components that are not obvious. And one of the, the things recently with bringing in this new language of the network, which is something I'm really excited about, it simplifies it down, but it also hides some of the complexity. Uh, but sharing, sharing that information makes closing the system very difficult. And I think it would almost get to the point where you'd almost you'd need to change international law to break this thing. So lots of governments worldwide, I think, would have to collaborate to try and do something to stop it. And that that there, I think, is going to be the paradox because you might have some MI6 spy with his gun wondering who he can point it at, and it's just it's the whole planet, you know. And that's that's where we want to be as quickly as possible. And doing that, I think, we're going to be able to. It's, it's almost self-protecting. I, I think once you do that properly, it, it becomes a sort of self-protecting thing. Because if if you've got something in your hands and you're saying this, you know, this information is fantastic. This is this is great for my children. They're going to do things that I never would have been able to do. Somebody's going to have to pry that out your cold dead hands. You're not going to. So the population of the of the world or whatever, I would hope, would be in the the mind that I want. I want access to this information. I don't want it taken off me. And it's not so much I don't want Google to own it and I don't want thing. It's just I, I want this information. I want this to be available to me. And then you also want to be able to have pictures of your kids or report cards or just papers that you're writing yourself with interesting things that you might invent one day. You also want them to be really, really private and personal to you and give them to who you want when you want. So. It's a very, I think it's a, it's something that, we did a whole bunch of patents, which is a horrible subject, but it was what we had to do years ago. But going through the patent office in the UK is quite a difficult thing. You've got to really be novel and innovative. It's not, it's, it's not something you can't put a patent in. But what we found was that at that point, that's when the security services look at all these patents. And that's why if you look at the patents I've filed, there's hundreds of them, and they're huge, and they're really, really hard to calculate what's going on. So we, we managed to get those things through with nobody really knowing what we were doing. And that also is a bit of protection, because once you get through the whole patent system, it means that you've been kind of looked at by governments, and they've said, oh, look, this is, this is OK. So my, my own impression is, Somebody could come after us, but it would be very difficult because we are literally not pointing to data, we're not hosting data, we don't know our customers, we never will, we can't, the network's designed in such a way that when people say to us, who uses that? I don't know. How many people use it? We'll have a rough idea, but we won't really know. And where are they? Well, they're all over the world. They're not in your jurisdiction, that's for sure. But the network will survive, even if the whole UK managed to somehow cut the internet off or America physically cut what you would have to do, the network will survive. And there's a broadcast capability in there now, so even if you switch these things off and switch them on, they all start beaconing and finding each other. So you have to start erasing software off disks all over the place. So it, the, the paradox for the people who would like to close it are, is quite a... It's quite an interesting one because I don't think when, when you say autonomous network or you know a self-healing network, people think, oh yeah, that's very good, that's yeah, interesting. It's like one of these hard drives you pull out, but no, it's not. It's actually a completely autonomous network. So, so but the thing people understand that it's already gone. Sorry. So before we go into complete autonomous network, can you actually explain what safe network is and and what components does it have? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, right. How's the easiest way to explain it? Just stepping back a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> you can imagine it's, it's split into three separate components, three three main components. So the first one, the first component is self-authentication. That, that, that's quite an important part. And the, the problem that that solves is if you have a completely decentralized thing, whatever it is, how do you as a person log into it? 
because it doesn't exist and it's always changing and all the machines are changing and you don't know whose computer's got what bit of software on it. So how do you how do you log in? So that's the self-authentication component. And it actually is much more simple than it sounds. What what you do is you store a piece of data that you're allowed to store for nothing. And that's made up of a simple way to explain it is there's two things. You type in password one, and it would be this piece of data stored at password one. And you type in password two, and that encrypts the piece of data. So that encrypted piece of data goes to wherever password one would store it. And when you go back to log in to the system, you ask it for password one. It gives you the bit of data back, and password two decrypts it. And that gives you information and the information that that gives you is your cryptographic keys to get access to your data. It also gives you a, a thing called a, a data map. So that that is the second problem. So there's a mechanism to log in and retrieve information. But the second problem is this is on a network connected to everyone's computer and data on everyone's computer. And you can't store data on people's computers. It's not possible. That they would be saying, well, I don't know what you're storing. What is that? It could be something weird. I don't want to. So the second problem is, how do you make your data live on a very hostile network in such a way that nobody knows where it is and it's always available to you when all these people's computers are switching off and on all the time? And that's where the self-encryption thing comes in. And that's a part of the system that's quite interesting because people just hear the word encryption and think, I'll just use AES encryption and why don't you do it? It doesn't work. So what the self-encryption thing does, it chops up all your data into lots and lots of pieces and throws those pieces out onto the network. But each piece is identified by the digital fingerprint of its contents. So that's a hash. You hear folk talking about hashes. And it's a digital fingerprint. So all these pieces go out. And you, if you imagine all of these pieces of the jigsaw are spread all about the network. And it, the clever thing about the self-encryption is if I've got a file and you've got a file and we don't know each other, they'll both create the exact same pieces, but they'll both be encrypted the same way. And people say, oh, that's terrible. People can read your data. and that's a conundrum for people. You can only decrypt a file if you've got the key or if you have the original information. So if you have the original information, you can create the chunks and then reverse them. But you don't need to because you've got the original information. So that's one of these things that hurts folks' heads. So the, the two initial issues are how do, you, how do you log into something that doesn't exist? And that's you just treat it as a big storage thing and you store a piece of data and get it back. And the second one is, how can you put your information on something that's going to go on everyone's computer? Well, you make it not information. You make it not data. So you pass it through this uh, process of chopping up and encrypt. The encryption part of the self-encrypting files isn't there for encryption. It's only there to make the data irreversible or not compressible, which is as close to ra random as possible. It's mathematically close to random, but there's no such thing as random. It's like infinity and guarantee and all the rest of it. So that gives us a way to log in and put data on it that's going to be safe. But then the next and the problem is, what is that thing that you put it on? Is it a server or is it something else? And that's where we said it can't be a server. It can't belong to anyone. In fact, where we don't know our customers, our customers should have no concept whatsoever of what these pieces of information are, where they exist, or, or whatever. And that third part of the puzzle is the network. That's the the DHT. You hear people talking about this distributed hash table. And a, a distributed hash table is a very simple thing. It's every computer's got a, an address, which looks like the hash of the data chunks that I was talking about. And the data chunks in a normal DHT would just go to the, the computers closest to that address and be stored there. 
but we don't do that because that would be too straightforward. That's how a DHT would normally work. The, as I said, you've got to have a situation where when you create this system, there can't be any centralized information whatsoever. So there can't be a centralized thing on a computer that says what chunks it's storing or any of this kind of stuff. So that's completely split up. And that's where, in MadeSafe, with the, the autonomous network, we have these things called personas. And that that's, people hear me speaking about ants, you know, this great ant story, but it's very true that every computer, every vault on the network, every computer has got multiple personas. And what that means is, if it gets a message sent to it, it can look at the name of the message and it knows exactly where it came from. And it can say, oh, in this situation, I'm looking after this client machine. Or in this situation, I'm looking after this piece of data. Or in this situation, I'm looking after the computers who are storing this piece of data. And these, these personas means that, in fact, I got a guy writing to me last night on email, a really nice guy, look, a data scientist looking into the XOR networking. But these personas basically mean that every computer on the network sees its own network. That's how XOR works. Every computer sees a different network from every other computer. But the personas mean that even inside the computer, every persona sees a different network from every other persona on that, that computer, which makes it very, a, a very natural system, a very lifelike system that the, compu the computer or the node will actually adapt itself to exactly the last thing it's been asked to do and then do that action and then importantly forget it. So don't hold state, so there isn't this state held about the network. It, you don't have things like, oh that person there sent this bit of information and because that, that increases complexity it gives you security issues, but the autonomous network part is extremely difficult, and it, and it's it's the most misunderstood part of MadeSafe because people see DHT and you think I'll just download the DHT and then I've got MadeSafe. It's not, it's nothing nothing like that. Um, it's a it's a very complex thing. But since February, we've found some information out which makes that complex thing much much simpler to understand. Uh, although you wouldn't think so when I'm blabbing on like this. But uh, those are the three components. That, 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 gives you, that gives you something that we've never had ever in the world of IT. And, and this is another thing that people don't get, is you could have encryption. You could encrypt your data and send it to Dropbox or send it to Google or send it to your friend or send it to somewhere else. But that only gives you logical security. Dropbox could corrupt that file, delete that file, or prevent access to that file. And what the Made Safe network or gives you, or the Safe network gives you, is for the first time in the planet, you've got two things that are really important. You can self authenticate, you create your account, and you can log in. The other thing that hasn't existed is your data then has true physical security. Because I can store something on the safe network and then say to anybody, well, go and delete it. Because you can't find it. We don't know where it goes. We know mathematically what will happen to it, but we don't know where it goes. So physical security of your information is something that we've never had. And you hear people saying, our servers are in nuclear silos and all this sort of thing. Who cares? You know, there was at some nuclear, some big server place out in the desert. When I was working abroad, the guy just chopped the electricity cable with an axe. You know, it's like there's there's all your VPNs and everything for you. But actual physical physical security of your information has never ever existed. I mean, you say that to people, we think that's rubbish. That must have been the case. That must exist. And then you think, where where does that exist? And then the ability to log into a fully decentralized network is the other thing that's never been done before. People say, you must be able to do that. 
or you know you're just like BitTorrent and you're like one of these other things. And you say, well, log into BitTorrent and get your physically secured information. You can't. You, you can't. There's not been a system that you can actually log into completely on your own, make up your own authentication details, log into it without an intermediary between you and the, the data. So those two those two things there have never existed and they're something when you speak to people about them, they're conv convinced that they do exist. They say, oh, surely Freenet is just what you're doing, log into Freenet and get your private data. Or surely something, it's not, it's completely different. So those underlying things of the, the authentication that can't be stopped, we can't stop anybody going onto the network, nobody can kick anyone off the network, and the physical security of your data are inordinately important, and, and they're, they're missed almost by every single uh, person who comments and writes about like, the safe network. It's, oh, there's safe going on, oh, it's got this, it's got a DHT, it's got this, oh, there's encryption, there's a, some cryptography term gets mentioned, you know, and the actual fundamental key issues are, are generally generally not spotted. But those, those key issues are irrelevant of Mete for the safe network. For humanity to have that ability now is phenomenal. Now humanity's now got that ability because we've showed them it works. So that is a fantastic contribution by everyone involved in the in the safe network and it's one of the things that even with the pods and stuff you can say well we know this is possible now uh, so what could we do what could we do now what could we do when you can log in well make your fridge have a login make your robots have a login have, have, everybody can have log in and securely share information and it, it's one of my driving things is to add like sort of semantic capabilities to the network so that you could have there's some robots in here. This is I've got all this stuff to build. Once the network's launched, I'm out here to build some of these things. But you imagine having a situation where you've got sort of artificial intelligence units all over the planet. Like a robot, it's easy to think, or a car, it's easy to think. And it could join a network and share information with its robots all over. The, so you could teach a robot in Troon, French, and then the one down in Safe Pod London would know French immediately. You could teach one CPR, they know CPR. And then when you start thinking, well, that's interesting. What if all medical machines were like that? And they would be able to do a scan that the doctor says, here's a scan because we're scanning your arm for some lump. And the machine says, we've done this scan before, and every time we see this particular skin defect, that person's got this X disease, give them this tablet. So the ability for machines to communicate are, is probably going to be as important as the ability for us to be securely communicating. David, I think yeah. everyone has one main question. So what has been built to date, and what's the remaining mandatory work before a full launch, and how long do you estimate it will take? Really short answer, please. <laughs> what's been built to date is millions and millions of lines of code, and lots of... Uh, like general components, oh, like safe time, crowd sale, self-authentication. I saw you had launch uh, V1 launcher. Yeah, we've got like self all the, the invention part, self-authentication, encrypting data, the network, the routing network, and the vault network. There, they're all built. The client sides all built. In fact, Lee was demonstrating that I think to some people recently the client-side API, which is quite an exciting thing because the client-side API is a RESTful interface and a POSIX interface. So if you've got something on Amazon or Google just now, an application, you should switch it over and it will just work, but you won't have any fees. Mm -hmm. So all those components are built. The parts that we're working on at the moment are, because of the changes that I made to the vault part, we've pulled routing apart, so we're rebuilding routing at the moment, and that's it's time scales are really difficult, but that's at the point now where all that we've got left is routing consists of five or six parts. So you've got a routing table, 
a sentinel, which is where all the security happens. Then you've got your transport layer, which is reliable uh, UDP, and then the messaging system, which talks to the vaults. So the sentinel's completing now. I think it might actually be complete. There was some commits today. And the, the thing that we're working mainly on is the transport layer. So it's just re-implementing that transport layer. But there's plenty of options for us. So we are on a daily basis in the office just now saying, are we ready to go yet? Are we ready to go? So it's very, very close. But the other side of that is while the core team are doing that, I've taken a bunch of the app devs to the site. And we're implementing a version of the system in, in Rust as well as C++. So there'll be probably two versions of this testnet very, very soon. We, in the Rust team, we've given ourselves three weeks. So we're in Tuesday. This is Last week was the get to know it, and this week and next week. So as the, the building it, and just in, in that alone, we've out of six libraries, we've done three in, in a week. But just because that sounds like weird, because you think, how come it takes you five years or something, or in C++ about four years, how could you re-implement it so quickly? And it literally is down to the this language thing that we found, the simplification of the code. And it, it caused a lot of problems for us in the office, because people were saying, just launch, just go, just go with what you've got. But it would have been really, really difficult to upgrade what, what we were going to give everyone. And we're going to give you thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of inordinately complex. Nobody ever gave us a bit of code in the C++ code. <coughs> it's very, very, very difficult. It's really high quality code. We got it tested by Coverity and stuff, and they couldn't find bugs. But there are bugs. There's no doubt about it. But they actually came back and said, there's no point in buying our software testing tools, because your software is so good. They're so high quality. But it, it goes back to what I was saying at the start. I've got a real focus on, I want to deliver something that's very, very efficient, but easy for other folk to, to work with. So, so yeah, so we've built all the systems built. Basically, the bit in routing is what we're working at just now out of all the libraries. And that part of routing, three-fifths of it are complete. Two-fifths were, were still playing a bit. I wouldn't... I wouldn't underestimate the networking part. The networking part is quite hard, but we've got Bjorn and Niall, uh, who are some of the top C++ programmers. They're part of the Boost community. They're, if, you, if you speak to people about C++ and mention you know, Niall Douglas and Bjorn Reese, they know them. They're, they're very uh, good program. They're working in the network part, along with Peter in Slovakia, and Fraser and Prakash in the office. So there's quite a team working on that part. But it has to be very secure and very efficient. That's why we put so much effort into it. So do you think we can, see, well, end user will be able to see something working by the end of this year? Oh, yeah, well, but before the end of this year, yeah, very soon. I'm a, I'm, today I was actually speaking to the guy saying, look, if the network's taking too long, this reliable, you just switch on TCP. And we'll just get the network up in the next couple of weeks. And what what that would mean is it would be us saying, here's the network. You can't actually run a vault from home, but you can run all the client stuff and all the client APIs, which would give people the ability to, to see applications and how they look and feel in their own hands and, and actually use them. So I'm quite prepared just now to take some, not shortcuts, but to take some decisions to allow us to show people what we're what we're doing and the the push for me up since February when we come up with this language the, the push for me is to get to the stage where we are doing a rolling release so every week you either get a core update or a client application update so the client application update will be a new application so we, we hope to have an application every couple of weeks because the, the app dev team I mean I know that we're we're really wanting the network out the, our our pods are definitely wanting the network out, and the people who have invested through uh, through investing in Safe or, or buying Safecoin to to help the project are all desperate for for this thing. But the app devs in the office are the ones that are 
the most scary because they're going crazy. You know, they've they've got all these things to give out and we're not able to do it. So over the next few weeks you'll see you'll see definitely activity in the test net again. That sounds good. So does anyone here have a question? No? Does anyone in Montreal have a question? No? Yeah. Uh, hi, how are you? Very I'm good. Kind of new, I'm kind of new to the project. I, I just started reading about MateSafe about two weeks ago. And I actually was reading about it because I was interested in starting a project just like this. And, uh, you know, through Googling, I, got, I was lucky enough to find it. And I was very excited. I'm here today with the Montreal pod. And um, I read as much as I could, tried to get as much information. I think it, there's a lot of great documentation, which is really good for any project this size. That's usually where big projects fail is a lack of understanding or documentation to get people to come in and help. Yeah. Um, so my only question was, uh, you've managed to create an autonomous, autonomous network with you know, a lot of great features. I was wondering if there's any ideas um, about building some sort of name resolution or DNS into the system itself so that it makes it easy to share stuff and maintain this, this so social aspect of the internet. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what's actually what we've settled on for the time being, because we were looking at um, a kind of public. There's a there's a public interface to it, so you can have public data, and you have a name. So I would be David, whatever. whatever. And we were doing that in a first come first serve basis, creating a special key type. There's a particular security concern over those key types because they're not, I won't get into it, but all of our keys hash to the public key plus some data and we know that it's like an X509 certificate without the ability to put in any random characters. And what we've, what we've decided on is that you will have a name on the network, so I'll be David and whoever, but underneath there'll be a uh, to begin with a 10 digit hex character which will be your actual address. So when you're speaking to people on the network, this hex information will and that will keep growing. It can go up to well, it's a 64 byte address basically a 512 bit. But you you only need 10 for the first first few million people. But that piece of information will go with your name as you're transmitting data about. But if you don't if someone if I wanted to speak to you for instance and and we were out of band, I would actually give you this ten digit carrot, this ten digit identifier that you can just type into your machine and then it'll come up. Oh, it's David. So you we have that ability. The, the good part about that is that messaging is something we've already got in the system. That's something that's that's been written the messaging uh, part. It's in the core, it's not in the the application side yet, but it's in the core. But the really cool part about that is where you've got your own private disk. So you, you have your disk and you log in and get all your disk information back. You can create a public disk. So where just now you have a public website, you would actually have a public disk route, which could have in it a website, some documents, some programs, some games, some whatever. And that just becomes public. So if, if you're on a network and you type safe, colon David that will go to this public information that I've made available and it's not limited to HTML it's basically any binary data that, that you, you want so I, the idea there is we'll have a slash www for websites a blog Twitter and all that sort of stuff and that's that's the way that just as people we can share information so you could just write HTML stuff and it would just look like the web, but that's not that clever, you know, because we're able to share now at the very POSIX API level. So you could share a complete operating system, programs, you can bootstrap an operating system off it. So the, the whole sharing aspect of today's internet is going to be quite different on, on SAFE, but it, it depends on the public name, so you're right. So, so what key challenges do you have in scrapping a media network? I never, I never got that either. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Awesome. So, 
what key <laughs> challenges do you have while bootstrapping the network? Which I think hint, because <coughs> network, you account for IDs, right? You don't uh, consider IP addresses per se. Exactly. So <coughs> does that present a challenge? Not, not so much that the challenge really is there's the, if you talk to the core devs, the phrase that they're all terrified of is zero state. It's the very first node that comes on the network. What what is that, and how how can he be the same as everyone else? Because every other computer is going to say, "I must talk to sixty four other machines before I get consensus." So the very first computer on the network can't ever get consensus for anything. So we have to put code in there specifically to deal with these guys. And with the changes that I made two months ago, it's going to remove all that problem, but prior to that it was quite bad because we had to build special nodes to start the network and then destroy them because they weren't following the rules. They would have been destroyed anyway but because they weren't following the rules, but though that bootstrapping is really, really difficult because I'll just talk you through it quite quickly. So you start one node, it's got no consensus. The next node has to connect with no consensus, so it has to trust the key. Then you get up to the group size, say it's 30. And then you actually start joining proper nodes that can get consensus. So you join another 10, so you get 40 nodes, but you want to kill these 30. And this 10 becomes unable to achieve consensus because there's only 10, they need 30. So starting the network like that was very, very difficult. So that bootstrapping process was really difficult, but we've been able to remove that now so that the network will actually just start. So you start a node now and it'll, it'll beacon and find other nodes and it, it actually knows that if it can't find anybody, it reduces its consensus measurement down to nothing. And as it finds nodes, it builds up to the proper consensus. So, What if I'm a malicious user and let's say I create twice as many nodes as there are on the test network? Yep. I'm still not able to attack it. Hmm? You can't attack it with twice as... If you create three times as many nodes as there are on the test network, you could start blocking access to data, potentially, but we did, we, there's a, for anyone that's interested in that, there's a tool in the MadeSafe common library called address space tool, and it's actually a security analyzer, so you can mimic networks and then mimic attack networks, and what we were able to find was with a group size of 32 and a quorum of 28, you need at least three times the amount of attack nodes to join the network. But it's really much more complex because you need to you need to have three times. So say you did a network of 200, you need about, it's actually over 1,000, it's more than three times in that case, but those 1,000 nodes that you need to join to, to start stealing data, you can't steal data because the network can't decrypt it, but to start preventing access to it, have to join the network with no one else joining it, so you have to ban all anyone else from being able to join, and you can't. So to attack it, you have to have at least three times the network population and hope that no one else is joining at the same time. Makes sense. And you have to behave because as, as a new node joins, it's got a very low rank, so it's like a baby node, and it has to grow up before people start paying attention to it. They go through their teenage years and we don't bother with them. And then once they've got a high enough rank, they start participating in this. So it, it actually becomes, when you introduce SafeCoin, that becomes problematic for an attacker because they have to have a, a huge amount of resource to bring onto a network. It has to behave. So while it's behaving, it'll earn SafeCoin. So they end up with lots and lots and lots of cash. And this whole, do they want to collapse the economy? So but, David, yeah, that makes sense. So just one step back, like what is SafeCoin, and can you explain in three minutes <laughs> the instant confirmation and zero fee uh, functionality? Yeah, it's very simple. If you simplify it way down, what you're doing with coins is you're just transmitting something from one person to another, and you you just want to know what happened. So it's some kind of promissory note thing. And what SafeCoin is is it's a piece of data that exists in the network, just like any other piece of data. But it's got certain rules. So there's an owner and a previous owner and a signature. 
And the signature is the previous owner signed it over to the current owner. So when I transmit a safe coin to you, you would you would see that I've now signed me being the current owner have signed you as the new current owner, and that that then belongs to you. And then you as the current owner are the only person cryptographically who can convert that to someone else. But it works for us because we've already got a secured data network. So if you're able to secure data, that's just a piece of data. It doesn't actually matter. So that could be anything. It could be one of these contracts, a smart contract, a computation. It's just data. And that's I think that's something that's quite quite good because when you look at it, safe coins, safe coins are nothing for the safe network. It's just a but a data, it could be any piece of data, it doesn't really make any difference to it. But when you think of that, then think, what could you actually create then? You can create computation, you can create very elaborate pieces of data that will follow certain rules. So the, the safe coin is literally a piece of digitally signed information that you can't bash out the network, you can't steal it, you can't take it off the network. The strength of it is, because it's just a piece of data, Transmitting it from one person to another is nothing. Checking a signature is zero cost to the network. So there's no transaction fee. But the downside of it is you can't carry it about in a wallet and then give it to someone off the network. So if I met you in a shop, I couldn't really, without a network connection, we can't really transmit this. But I think that's probably the case for most digital currencies and it would be a bit crazy not to be connected to network and try and do that anyway because all the double spend thing would happen even if it was Bitcoin. So I know we have developers around here so can you explain us how the open source business model for the application development works on the safe network? Yeah it's I hope it does work because it's where we are going. <laughs> uh, we are just becoming a pod as well and what happens is Really, as as people earn Safecoin, so what? How you earn Safecoin is a GET request from someone for some piece of data that nobody knows where it is comes to your machine. The the nodes round about your machine in this consensus group agree that you've got that GET request, and they basically take the hash of all their IDs, the hash of you, and the hash of the request, and it's just modulo arithmetic. So it's a big number. So we just do like mod a million. If it equals zero, that means that's a safe coin farming request. And the safe coin basically is just a space in the network, 32 uh, bits. Typically, 32 bits. So that that address of that thing when it was all hashed together, that mod a million equals zero. We take that thing and say, would this fit onto the network in the safe coin space? And if it does, then that that person's got a safe coin. So that's how farming works. It's a very simple way. But when that happens, the person gets a safe coin. Well, say, say the person gets 10 safe coins, because that's simpler to do in my head. The person would get 10 safe coins. One safe coin would go to the application who did that GET request. So <coughs> that, that application is a web browser or a movie thing or any application that's getting data from a network, what you do as an app developer is you you put your wallet address inside your app and that gets transmitted on the network. So when that farming thing is successful, a safe coin gets sent to you, 10 goes to the farmer and you, you've then got safe coin and it immediately falls like, oh well somebody could just change my change my wallet address so they could just take my application. But that application would be delivered to users on your public drive that we spoke about earlier. Which is really interesting because you don't install it. Basically it's there, it's on a drive, you just click on it in your computer. It's so when you create a program, like say you were Mozilla, you did uh, Firefox, you just put it in a, a public drive and let everybody get access to it. And the drive will know I'm being accessed by a Windows 32 or a Windows 64 machine and just use the correct libraries so you don't actually install it. And the good thing there is that means it can't have a virus in it because it can't change. The virus would change its signatures, all the rest of it, it changes the hash value. You wouldn't find the data. 
but you can't have a virus, you're not installing the thing, but it's fully working. So another angle to software developers getting paid for having apps that are valuable and valid. If people use the app, there'll be lots more gets, you'll get money for it. If they don't use it, they won't you won't get money. Which I quite like, but you don't need to advertise. But the other thing is you don't need to have installers and do all this sort of nonsense either. You're just literally building the logic that you think will be beneficial for people. And that's a, a good thing. That makes sense. David, we have one question from um, submitted over internet, and person is asking, um, so network is distributed and you distribute data in, into chunks. What size are the data chunks? Maximum one megabyte, and the minimum is one K. Huh. So the, the one K ones actually go into the data map and get chunked another way, but yeah, one meg is the maximum. So the the jump size. So David, we covered a lot of uh, massive safe, like safe coins, network, um, ideology of privacy, security, and freedom. But to me as an end user, how would I use a safe network myself? I don't know anything about development, I don't know anything about... That's, that's a critical part. So there's lots and lots and lots of these things about you. There's the TPG and all the rest of it to make you secure. And our approach has been, this has to be smarter, faster, and better than any existing application. So if you download, like for instance, the safe network version of Dropbox, it'll just be infinite size or whatever, you know, you pay safe coin, but you get a huge amount of space. It won't put data on your computer. You'll be able to access all this information uh, in real time through it a drive, but the data never goes on your computer, so it's very secure. So it would just look like, in that case, it would look like Dropbox, but you think, oh, good God, it's huge, it's enormous, and I'm not paying much money for it. And it, or you use the mail system, and it just looked like email, but it's not, it's safe mail, and when you're sending those mails to other people, they're fully encrypted and private and all the rest of it, or chat applications, and all of those can exist inside that Dropbox thing, if you want. But if you think of any application just now that's got Amazon or Google as a back end, just yeah, that'll just look exactly the same. Uh, I would hope it'll be a bit more exciting than that because just now if you're trying to develop, say, a Dropbox thing, you'll have to go and pay Amazon however many millions of pounds as your user base grows and you've got all this back-end stuff and you need to sign up and get API keys and all that sort of stuff. Whereas with the safe network, you just say, there's the API, I'll program something on it. And if folk use it, fine. And it hasn't cost me a penny. And I've got all this back infrastructure. So there's no cost to rolling stuff out. And so I would hope that would allow lots of people to try lots of stuff that you just can't try just now on like the Amazons and Googles and whatnot. <laughs> If you if you go from zero customers today to a billion tomorrow, you'll probably go out of business with the current business models. Whereas with the the kind of working on safe, well, we don't even know that you're there. We don't know you've got an application. We don't know who's got it. But if you go from zero to a billion users, it's perfectly okay. You, you'll just get paid much quicker. But you're not having to think how to scale up my infrastructure. I need to buy all these engineers and data centers. That's all gone. And it should be gone. It's a bad thing. Just letting to know that we still have, but we only have ten minutes left. So if we have question now, is the time to ask. So I have a question. Uh, how does? So you mentioned that you you don't have to worry about scaling up and, and any of that. But a lot of that has to do with data processing, and you don't want to do the data processing on your local machine. So how does that work with the safe network? Data processing in terms of uh, everybody uses your application will just for example if you want to make a Google <laughs> if you want to do a Google that that's a, like a, a huge system so you would you would write that in a no no SQL type thing so that's that's you building something like a fully distributed enormous system rather than a, a client application I think what you're saying. So if you're doing that, you would write it in a, a NoSQL. So if, if you imagine 
the way that the way that Google do it just now, or the way that Amazon do it, or Facebook, or Netflix, they use things like Cassandra or Hadoop, and that that underneath the MainSafe network looks exactly like that, except with Cassandra and Hadoop and things like that, you have to have them in secured. Well, Hadoop, you can only have a certain amount of nodes off of a name server. And if you take the kind of Hadoop type architecture and just think, imagine that name server was completely distributed, so you had, or decentralized, so you had as many name servers as you had nodes in the network. So it's fully scalable, but uh, there's just no cost to you. So if you if you created something like that and then roll it out onto the network, so the, the network already can handle all the NoSQL type stuff that you want to do. So you really just want to look at the likes of Hadoop or whatever and say, well, if I was doing that or if I was doing a Cassandra type thing to create a Facebook, I would just do it like this and then we would help you implement that. It's it's just the same as you would if you were, if you imagine that you had access to millions or thousands of servers, you can just take the same approach and look at the API of those kind of projects. And it's one of my short term goals is to have, at the moment the vaults will calculate things on how we've told them to calculate them, but they, they will become malleable soon so that you, you'll be able to, in that kind of situation, build global computational infrastructure, which is, is one thing, but it's, it's almost a separate thing from the user application. The, the user apps are are much simpler to think about because you're just doing Dropbox and web browsers and email stuff and all the rest of it. But global computation is the kind of game changer there. Because if it was global computation, you probably wouldn't build Google. You'd probably build some kind of... Uh, some kind of semantic artificial intelligence or just intelligent search capability. <laughs> Fair play. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, Montreal, do you have any questions on the note of few minutes remaining? We've got to be in English now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a plan to build a new pr protocol at the application le level, something like a hypermedia safe protocol to to replace uh, HTTP? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what we're uh, uh, I have another one. Uh, okay. Uh, Capturing and, and safe. How the safe network deal with uh, partition? Partitioning. What well, uh, you you mentioned if you you cut uh, yeah. physically uh, two part of the network. What would happen the, there? The two part of the network can kind of uh, continue to to do uh, uh, all the good <laughs> all the good stuff of the safe network. But uh, what happened yeah. when? The, the connection come back. All, yeah. all the safe network deal with that. Well, we, we did some looking into that, but basically you would have to cut, before you start losing data, you would have to chop off at least three continents at, at once, like simultaneously. If you take just a continent or a country or a, a village, say, and partition it that way, it's like what would happen to the the very small part of the network, and it, it would it would have the data that. So if you if you cut the network in two, you wouldn't really notice any difference. There'd be no difference. Or if you cut it in quarter, you wouldn't notice any difference either. When you start cutting it in less than a quarter, so that if you get a segment which is less than 25% of the network, it may not have at that particular time access to data, but it probably knows it should have. So it'll wait on that data. Uh, so for, from data perspective, it's not really too much of an issue. You might have a wait or, or whatever. The issue with segmentation would be more to the likes of if you had something like Safecoin. It, it'd be like partitioning in Bitcoin network. You know, the two chains would grow, and when you join together, it's what's the longest one and all the rest of it. 
So you would have issues where you've got things like Safecoin or a, a cryptocurrency, but the data and communications, you wouldn't. If the if the person you're trying to speak to is just gone, when you send a message, it'll it'll actually go to the edge of your partition and wait until the network rejoins and then go to that person. So the the significant, a huge network partitioning is something that we've discussed a few times, and it's. You would have to have less than a quarter of the network before you could start seeing any issues with losing data. But at that point as well, you have to think, well, if the network's global, maybe we don't care about data at that stage because if we've lost continents, you know, something, there's some major event happened. So, but if if you're on, you would have to be on a network that's part of the network that's at least less than 25% before you start considering there might be an issue with data at all. Is that all, um, Montreal? Uh, yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. So, David, what, final questions. Like, does anyone have anything we really want to ask? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So, David, like, we spoke a lot about like putting data on the network, displaying it, um, gathering it to do computation. Does the data on the safe network ever expire or gets forgotten in commas? No. No, it lasts forever. It's a, it's an area that I would like to see some of it expiring, but we've we've never had a good answer to it. So what will happen is older data will archive. So all that that means is lots of chunks will come together to form a mega chunk, and the reason to do that is just to remove administration. So rather than looking after a million chunks, the network will look after one. Uh, so those will be the archive units, but in terms of uh, data disappearing, no, no, it stays on, it stays on forever, because we can't really tell. Is that a paper that just nobody's read for fifty years, and then it's going to become valuable one day? Um, and we can't tell if it's public or private data either. So, it's one disadvantage of being so secure. Like we don't, we don't know. David, you must have applications you want to see uh, early on. Um, can you share that? Like, what kind of application do you want to see it being built? Really that I would like to see quite quickly are actually communication applications. So we had that thing in the MadeSafe org recently, which was quite a thing. You know, those kids in Australia, that class that we're saying, you know, they're watching us and it's great. And I just feel that it's those kind of, it's the kind of, it's teenagers and, and whatnot that are really looking for how can we talk to each other and not be bothered by other people and and I think communications would be one of the early things and I think it drives me for that. I remember seeing a thing and it was a guy in Israel talking to a guy in Palestine in two cafes when they were all killing each other and when he got to know each other and each other's families they didn't want to kill each other anymore. So, Communications that are not able to be blocked and not able to be snooped on, I think, are is a is a big thing for me. And the, the other thing which is slightly contentious is I would like to see all access to data removed. So I, I would like to have no paywalls. I, I, I want to read any scientific paper I want to read, and I want everybody to be able to do that and find out the problems with them. So it's a kind of contentious. I'm not talking about piracy, but access to the world's knowledge, I think, is anything that promotes that, um, we really be behind it. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Um, just last word for Montreal. Um, do you have any guys? What? Uh, last word, do you have any? Yeah, yeah, we have another question. Oh, yeah, hi. I just had one last question. It's a short one. Do you have any provisions for uh, revisioning of data? Yeah. Versioning. Yeah, the version. There's an infinite amount of versions at the moment, so you just every new thing's a new version. So you can you can hold as many versions as you want. So when you store files, you're not just you like when I make a change to a file or something, you're actually storing an increment of it. Yeah, it stores it stores part of the changes, but. So the, the file will be new, but it's actually your directory information. So you, you hold your own directory information, and that contains versions of files that you previously had. And that, that list is as long as you want it to be. 
So if you're if you're buying space with Safecoin, for instance, you maybe don't want to be holding versions of everything, but the network will hold every version of every piece of data. Okay, uh, that answered my question. So sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Francis, thank you, Montreal. Thank you for calling in. David, thank you very much for coming on board and helping us, answering a few questions. Thank you. Any time if I can, any help I can give, I'm more than happy, so. Absolutely. We should fly in and to London sometime. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, guys. Take care. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay.